is now under Roman control, ruled by Tiberius Caesar, and under his cruel authority, life is harsh for many of the Jews. But on this day, there's hope for the future, a promise for a new beginning. Because on this day, a betrothal between a young groom and his bride is taking place. I don't think it's possible to overstate how important a wedding is in the Middle Eastern culture today as it was in that day, the first century. A wedding was the most important event that would take place in any town for anyone. In fact, as word spread throughout the streets that a betrothal was taking place, everyone who was able would rush to the main gate to witness it. Everything took place at the gate, and this was really, really important because this is where you found the elders. The elders uh, ratified legal agreements, and if you held the ceremonies near the gate, you would have layers of people that would gather around who are maybe not family members, maybe not friends. So you see, having wedding guests the way we have them today wasn't important to them. They wanted witnesses because you can't make a covenant without having witnesses to ratify the covenant. There is a written proposal that is presented. It is a written covenant of marriage that the bride accepts. They would be asked, do you agree on these terms? They would say, we do, which means that they can't go back on it. They can't say, I didn't know that was in there or those terms were disagreeable to me. After the agreement outlining the union between the two families was publicly read, gifts were then exchanged, with the most extravagant going to the bride. In fact, contrary to popular belief, a dowry, or the price that was paid to the bride's father in Galilee, was not a purchase of the bride as property as it was with surrounding cultures in the Middle East, but rather an insurance policy that would help take care of her if anything were to happen to her beloved. But what comes next will set in motion a sequence of events that will shape the future for generations to come. Then it focuses down onto the moment where everyone holds their breath. What happens is the bridegroom is then handed a pitcher of wine. The groom then pours wine into a ceremonial cup that will be offered to his desired bride-to-be. And it was called the cup of joy with both hands reverently and respectfully and fearfully. He would pass it to his bride. When the groom presents the cup, she now has the choice to, uh, as to whether or not she will accept or reject this proposal for marriage. The moment the cup is handed to the bride, she's given all power to stop the wedding by pushing the cup back and rejecting the bridegroom. Contrary to all other wedding customs in the Middle East, the bride in the Galilean wedding possessed the final authority. She alone had the power to accept or reject the offer from the groom. The betrothal could not be completed without her willing acceptance to drink from the cup of wine. But on this day, during this betrothal, the bride accepts.
The groom will then also take and drink from the cup, solidifying the new covenant. But then he says something truly profound. And then the bridegroom says publicly so everyone can hear, you are now consecrated to me by the laws of Moses, and I will not drink of this cup again until I drink it anew with you in my father's house. But to understand why this phrase is so profound, we must look at another act recorded later in the scriptures. During the Last Supper, Jesus offered a cup of wine to his disciples to signify a new covenant with them. And after his disciples drank from the cup, Jesus then said something similar to what a Galilean would have heard from their own weddings. He said, But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This is exactly why when he gave them the cup, he actually says, this is the new covenant in my blood. I'm about to pour my blood. It's a promise. We're going to be together again, and we're going to mark it by drinking the wine. Yeah. It's something important. The breaking of bread and offering of wine, these acts were to form a new union, a new promise meant to deliberately set in motion events of unimaginable importance. In my Arab culture, you eat from the same bread and you drink from the same cup. The thought is that that which is in you is in me. It is a common union, communion, no longer two, but one. When Jesus says that at that last supper, this is my body given for you, broken for you, he is talking as a bridegroom to his bride. When he says to them, uh, this is the cup in my, of my blood in the new covenant, that's how they would seal the betrothal in the ancient wedding. Well, when you think about the Galilean disciples, they understood exactly what it was saying regarding these things. They were familiar things. The illustration was entirely clear to them. When Jesus said that, his Galilean disciples at the Last Supper heard only one thing, wedding. In fact, this might explain why later in the Gospel records, the disciples asked Jesus only when the events of the last days would take place, and not why. Because as Galileans, they likely had already made the connection, especially given Jesus' first recorded miracle which took place in the town of Cana, when he turned water into wine at a Galilean wedding. And I find this most fascinating that the first miracle Jesus ever performed was at a wedding. And that wedding had the same cultural dynamic that Jesus was describing when he was explaining to his disciples about his soon return. Good morning, Calvary Community Church. We just wanted to share that video with guys just to prepare you for today's message, which actually is titled Before the Wrath as we continue in the message revelation. But hey, if you're new here, we want to let you also know what's going to be happening in our service overall. So we're going to start with some worship in just a few minutes. Then we're going to do a time of announcements to let you guys know about all the stuff that's going on in Life Our Church, which actually is quite a bit right now. So there's just a few announcements that will be coming up. We'll be doing a time of tithes and offering where we're just going to be able to give back to God what he's already given to us. And then Pastor Rob's going to come up, and like I said, we're going to do a sermon titled Before the Wrath today. And then at the end of the service, we're going to close out with one more worship song. But let's all stand up now as we start our morning with some worship. Between us, 
Jesus on the wall. Sing one more time. Wherever you lead me, whatever it costs me, oh, all I want is you, Jesus. All I want is you. You are the refuge I run to. You are the fire that leads me through the night. I'll follow you
is with us, if more of you. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all of me, take
we just thank you for this time of worship this morning and be able to just sing to you. And I just really pray that we don't just let those words just be words on a screen, but be words we truly believe that we want to be more like you, Lord. And not just today, but every day in our lives, Lord, we're always striving to be more and more like you, Lord. In this crazy world that is dying to know you, Lord, we just pray that you continue to show your presence not only in this place, but in this world, Lord. We thank you for all that you've already done, all you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you for worshiping us. You guys can take a seat. Good morning, Calvary Community Church. We are so glad that you've joined us today. And I hope you're not tired of hearing my voice because I'm going to help Alyssa with announcements today. <laughs> First off, we'd like to ask that you silence your cell phones. Just take them out and check really quick. We want to make sure that we don't have any distractions during our service today. And if you have a student in high school or middle school, we just want to let you know about our youth ministry, Armory Student Ministry. Um, or, or if you are a high school or middle school student in here, it starts at 3 o'clock here at the church on Sundays. But the doors open at 2.30, so if they want to come a little bit early, they can. Speaking of youth, we have an awesome summer camp that our youth will be going to this summer. It's in July. Um, it is $360 for the camp. However, we really want every student that wants to go be able to go. So we're going to have some fundraisers coming up March 22nd and March 28th so that you can be able to help support and send as many youth as possible. And if you're new here at our church, is this your first time ever being at Calvary Community Church? We want to let you know that in the back of the seats, there is a connection card that you can uh, fill out just so that we can know a little bit more about you, how we can be praying for you um, in your lives, and just so that you can feel more connected here at our church. If you forgot your Bible today, we're about to go into a Bible study. That's okay. Just raise your hand and one of our ushers will bring one to you. And um, I don't know if you knew this, but a month from now is Easter, only one month away. Um, but we're doing something special on Good Friday, on April 2nd. We're going to be doing a night of worship. We're just going to be doing like, a lots of worship songs and a small devotion just so that we can remember what Christ did for us on the cross 2,000 years ago. And that's uh, you can see that's coming up in about a month, April 2nd at 7 o'clock p.m. So we hope to see you there. And we have a church-wide study that's starting even earlier than that on March 22nd, but it's happening in all our discipleship groups, both on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And uh, we just want to let you guys know a little bit more about that, so we have a video prepared for you. So let's turn our attention to the screens. everyone, I'm Raleigh Whalen, Discipleship Pastor here at Calvary Community Church, and I'd like to invite you to join with us in a church-wide small group Bible study titled Evidence That Demands a Verdict. This six-week DVD series will reinforce your faith by providing answers to some difficult questions like, did Jesus really claim to be God? Is our Bible accurate and reliable? Is there such a thing as objective truth? and more. We already have eight small groups currently meeting on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, and intend to add a number more for this study. And we want you to be a part of this new study. Won't you join one of our small groups? We have groups specifically tailored for men, women, couples, and youth that will be meeting every week, and we're saving a seat for you. We'll kick off our series with a Sunday morning message on March 21st and begin meeting together during the six weeks that follow. We also want to encourage you to invite someone to join us. There are sign-up sheets both here in the Worship Center and outside at our welcome carts. So please don't wait. 
Go ahead, jump in, and expect a blessing. Good morning. Good morning. Y'all sound like y'all in the classroom. We ain't in the classroom. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We've been a transition to our, our other part of our worship, which is the giving. And we want to praise God for you all that come out every morning to hear the word of God, to be blessed. But not only to be blessed, to be a blessing, because God called us to be a blessing. Um, you all know this, we, we got this church and we are going out to give the word to the lost. That's our number one charge is to give the word out to the lost. And we pray right now that as we transition to this, this act of worship, the act of giving, you see the three ways to give at the text online in the envelopes, the boxes are in the back. They are, they are the aqua blue boxes and we praise God for you. And we want you to be able to lift up God by what you do. And you do a lot. Uh, we praise God that this church is God's blessing. People are coming to know Christ. People are coming to, to grow in Christ. Isn't that wonderful? And that's, that's what we want to do. I know it's early in the morning for you. And it's hard to crank up. We're getting that chain cranked. So as we crank up, prepare whatever you're going to give to the Lord. And I want to say this. Um, to you old believers, y'all, some of y'all do this already. Paul said in the, in the scripture, uh, he was telling the disciples to, before he come to the church, he said, already have it prepared what you're going to give. And I know some, some of us, like we get paid on Friday, it's an act of worship to be able to, to give what you already set aside for the Lord and pray over it and worship God and say, Lord, I thank you for the blessing. And we praise God. We seen a gloomy day last year. Yesterday was kind of gloomy. Look at the day. Praise the Lord. We live in Florida. Thank you, Lord. We live in Florida. So as we finish transition to this part, we want to bow our heads before the Lord and pray and bring our offering to him. Father, as we come before your throne right now, we ask you to fill us with your Holy Spirit. Because we can do nothing without you. We ask you to move in a mighty way in our hearts and minds this morning. And I pray that you just bless each and every one that's giving those that are finna give, I pray that you will bless them this morning. And I pray right, right now that you will look upon those that are coming here to the next service, that you will bless their hearts and minds, that their, their hearts will be prepared to hear your word, to worship you, to lift up your name. And I pray that anybody that's sitting in this service this morning that do not know you as Lord and Savior, I pray for their souls right now, that they'll come to know you and to lean and trust in you and you alone. Because you have, you're the only one who have the words of eternal life that is in Jesus Christ. And we give you praise. Amen. Today with worship, I mean, I don't think it gets any better than that. I mean, I got a whole lot earlier than that, but man, when you when you're able to come together with a group and body of believers who are praising King Jesus, man, it's worth it's just worth celebrating in that way. Thank you, Joe, for the announcements because ties are ties and offering are a form of worship. For those of you who are new to that, maybe that's a foreign concept to you, but but uh, it, it's 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 awesome to be able to know that um, we have a church of generous people. So thank you guys for for your uh, your generosity. 
So um, today we're going to do a Bible study. It's going to be a little bit different than, than what you're normally used to. It's going to be moving into in preparation for chapter 6 of Revelation. But um, before we talk, more, talk about that, uh, let me share this uh, with, especially for those of you who are new, um, those online and those who are new here today. Um, we happen to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that uh, people are in three, three different parts of their life and they're in storms. You're either going into a storm, if you know what I mean, uh, the storms of life. You're either just coming out of one or guess what? <laughs> you're in preparation for the one that you're going to be going into. And sometimes that doesn't feel all that wonderful to hear that. However, we as a, um, a church family, a church body, we want to be able to, to be a storm solution for people um, in their different phases of life. One is we want to be like a hospital, and a hospital that ministers to broken and hurting people. That's a good thing, is it not? So we're all in different phases of our life, and some of us are hurting. We need to be ministered to, and there's, I'd say there's nothing better than being able to have a brother or a sister come up and give you a hug and tell you they're praying for you and they're thinking about you, or get that text from them, or communication that, um, that says, man, I love you and I care for you. So we want to be a hospital. We also want to be a classroom. We want to be able to answer the questions that everyone has in life. Who am I? Why am I here? What's my purpose? Is there really a God? So we want to be a classroom that answers those questions. And then finally, we want to be like a boot camp where we can um, build and grow and send out people for Jesus because um, like a boot camp, who go into battle, we go into battle. I mean, do you guys know what it's like? Can I get an amen this week? Anybody's in a battle at the workplace or places in your life where you're coming and going? I tell you what, people need the empowering of the Holy Spirit because that's the answer. And finally, um, our mission as a church really are the three Ds. We want to be able to draw people to Jesus because we believe Jesus is the answer to all of life's problems. We want to be able to then disciple people in Jesus. And I know these, um, th these groups, evidence that demands a verdict, we're going to bear a lot of fruit from that. We're going to grow up a little bit. We're going to be able to answer questions that we might not have been able to answer otherwise. I mean, many of you have been asked questions that just stump you. Like, whoa, they ask, someone asked you a question, why do bad things happen to good people? Whoa, good question, right? And then, of course, um, this evidence demands a verdict is going to really going to help you grow and develop um, in, in, in your greater understanding. It'll build confidence for you. And finally, we are, as a church family, um, called to draw people to Jesus because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And he is so amazing to be able to have. So I want you guys to be able to um, w watch a video um, that perhaps shows how a world can show you and I that everything is okay on the outside, but deep inside they're searching for answers. So if you guys could watch this video, I think you're going to be blessed. So Mario, are you spiritual? Yes. What do you mean by that? The way I grew up, my heart was in my neighborhood, but my love I've always been loyal to love. I've always known that. But it deceived me. I confused the two. If you confuse the two, it lets you down. And if it, you have to pick yourself up, yourself up. You can't let anybody else pick yourself up. Is that what you mean by spiritual? Just self improvement? Or yes. Just talking about God? Self improvement. That's what I believe in. I believe in all religions have a universal meaning. I believe in the power of the universe. I believe that we're all just human and we're all here to spread love. And that's all I got to do. <laughs> so, do you think God created everything? Or do you think evolution created everything? We can never know, ever. <laughs> oh, you may not be able to ever know, I know. You can know within. You hear that, Mario? I know, <laughs> you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you can't say we can never know. That's limiting your knowledge. Um, do you ever think about how amazing life is? I mean, look at the blueness of the sky and the sun. Do you ever think about the sun, how incredible it is? How incredible it is? It's 93 million miles away, and it's just warm enough to ripen your tomatoes. Any closer, we're all dead. Further away, we're all dead. Do you ever think about how amazing that is? I do. So how did it get there? I had to learn it myself. I had to go within, and nobody can teach it for you. You have to go within, and you can unlock the secrets to the universe if your loyalty lies in the love for yourself, that's it. You love yourself? I do. You love God? I love God, but in my mind, God is the entire universe. So well, I love that's, the entire. It's called pantheism. There's a difference between the painter and the painting. 
You don't love the painting, you love the painter because he's the genius that created the painting. And so if you love creation, you're setting your affection on the creation rather than the creator and that's called an ordinate affection. It's a wrong order of affections. If your mum gave you a gift and you love the gift more than you love your mother, there's something wrong. You should be saying, hey mum, thanks for this car. I'm grateful to you, not to the car. Grateful to you for the gift. Make sense? I personally know who I am and why I'm here. I found my purpose from within. I know that to be true. I've never lost that in my entire life. I've been the same person. You need love. You can't be a man without love. You have to separate yourself from love in order to find that for yourself. Nobody else can do it for you. That's the point. Do you trust yourself? I do. How many, let me ask you a question. Spell the word shop. S-H-O-P. What do you do when you come to a green light? G-O. Good work. <laughs> Spell the word silk. S-I-L-K. What do cows drink? M-I-L-K. No, they drink water. <laughs> so never trust yourself, because we are we're easily deceived. The Bible says, he who trusts his own heart is a fool. A lot of people are dead because they trusted their own heart. They made judgments. I can beat that truck and overtake this car, and they couldn't. Wrong judgment. Let me ask you another question. You said your concept of God is that he is the universe. Yeah. Do you think God is happy with you or angry at you? Depending on what you do, God will love you for it either way. <laughs> That's what I believe in. So how are you doing morally? Are as you, long as you stay true to yourself, God will love you. It doesn't matter what you do as long as you know in your heart you're doing it for the right reason, love. You have nothing to worry about in this world whatsoever. It's called faith. Let's see how you're doing. Do you think you're a good person? Yes. How many lies have you told in your life? I've lost count. Okay, what well, do you call someone who's told lies? A liar. So you've blown that one. Have you ever stolen something, even if, you're, even if it's small? Yeah. What do you call someone who steals? A liar. A thief. <laughs> if you deny that you lie, steal, cheat, and deceit, you become those things. And that's what you have to understand as a human, is that you can't lose yourself in yourself, because that's the double-edged sword of love. It's out there. You just got to find it for yourself in order to truly know what it is. And I just want to push that to everybody. <laughs> That's okay, Mary, you were saying that you found yourself. What are mankind's origins? Where do we come from? Women. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, originally, I don't mean from your mother. I mean, where did, what's, what's the origin of humanity? Authenticity and love. No, the origin, where did we come from? What was in the beginning? Man and woman. <laughs> yeah, but for man and woman. Who created man and woman? A higher power. Uh, who was that? God. <laughs> okay. Why do we exist as human beings? To love. Okay. And where are, you, where are you going when you die? Whatever you did here, it depends. <laughs> okay, that's true. Now, third commandment, you should not take God's name in vain. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Okay, would you use your mother's name as a cuss word? Never. Never, because you honor her, but you haven't loved and honored God. You've used his name as a filth word to express disgust, which is called blasphemy. So serious, it's punishable by death in the Old Testament. Appreciate your honesty and your, uh, and your patience with me. Now, Jesus said, if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Yes, I'm a man. <laughs> Have you had sex before marriage? Yes, I'm a man. So, Murray, I'm not judging you. You judge yourself, but you've told me you're a lying, thieving, blasphemous, fornicating, adulterer at heart, and you have to face God on Judgment Day. If he judges you by the Ten Commandments, I've looked at four, you're going to be innocent or guilty? Guilty. Heaven or hell? Hell. <laughs> now, does that concern you? Deep down, yeah. Man, it horrifies me. We've just met. I love you. I care about you. The thought of you going to hell just breaks my heart. Do you know what death actually is, according to the Bible? Ultimate enlightenment. Well, no, it's wages. It says the wages of sin is death. God's given you death as wages for your sin. He's paying you in death. He's given you capital punishment. Like a judge looks at a heinous criminal who's raped three girls and then murdered them. He says, you've earned the death sentence. This is your wages. This is what's due to you. And sin is so serious to God, Mario, that he's given you capital punishment. Lying, thieving, blasphemous, fornicating, adulterer at heart. Now tell me, what did God do for guilty sinners so we wouldn't have to go to hell? Do you remember? 
<clears throat> he came up with the idea that depending on what you do here, you're either good or bad, and that's it. You just got to stick to that and have the faith in that. And then no, that's not what he did. Jesus suffered and died on the cross for the sin of the world. The Ten Commandments are called the moral law. You and I broke the law. Jesus paid the fine. That's what happened on that cross. Mario, if you're in court and someone pays your fine, a judge can let you go. Did you know that? You can say, Mario, there's a stack of speeding fines here. This is deadly serious. But someone's paid him. You're free to go. And he can do that which is legal and right and just. And God loves you so much, he became a human being, suffered and died on the cross to take the punishment for the sin of the world. That means you don't have to end up in hell. God can legally forgive your sins because he's the lover of your soul. And then Jesus rose from the dead and defeated death. Mario, if you give up the battle and just say, God, I'm a rebel, and you repent and trust in Christ, God will forgive every sin you've ever committed and grant you everlasting life as a free gift. Do you believe what I'm saying? Yes. It's the gospel truth. I wouldn't lie to you. Are you ready to repent and trust in Christ? <laughs> yes. Can I pray with you? <laughs> sure. Father, I pray for Mario. Thank you we met today. Thank you we met today. I pray today he'll truly repent and trust in Jesus and have his sins forgiven in a second and pass from death to life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you have a Bible at home? No. I'm, I'm going to give you some literature. Do you know why you're, you're weeping? Any idea? Because I've sinned as a man. That's called contrition, and the Bible says godly sorrow, being sorry for your sins, works repentance. So I trust today that God's brought conviction of sin to you and that you know you've sinned against God, and you'll understand that God can forgive you and grant you everlasting life as a free gift. I've got some literature for you. Okay, Mario, thank you for talking to me. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you <laughs> interviewing me. I do. So, hey, so Paul writes in Romans 10, 14 and 15, um, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Would you guys pray with me? Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus, and it is good news to have the beautiful feet with um, precious and wonderful news about Jesus and who he is and what he did. And Lord, we're, we're just weeks away from celebrating the resurrection day, the day that you um, broke those, chain, those chains of sin and death when you were on that cross and you said it was finished, and three days later you rose from the grave. So Lord, help us to be mindful of those who are um, who, who look and act like they've got it all together on the outside, but like this young man um, was broken on the inside, but he did not know what he didn't know until Ray Comfort shared um, the good news with him of the love of Jesus. So helpful to help us to be like Jesus. Help us to be like Ray. Help us to just invite people to, to come to church, to do fellowship, to have coffee with, and just to talk and be an encouragement to people. So I pray that you'd, you'd bless our study today as it leads to um, your wrath. And uh, Lord, this, is, this message today is uh, called Before the Wrath. So help us to know and understand um, what it means um, to, uh, to know that you're a God who is um, patient and long-suffering, and you don't want anyone to be separated from you for eternity, but you want everyone to, po to possibly be there to be in heaven with you. So bless our time together today. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, amen. amen. So um, there are cards on your seat, and I want to, could you guys grab it, please? Just grab the card and wave it. Let me see that you've got it. And then um, what would really be cool to do is if, if, you're, if you're one of those um, types of people that could say, you know something, I'm going to hand out 20 of these this week. One doesn't seem like a whole lot, and you're going to put a whole stack of them in the back of your pocket. I mean, Jack's in the, in the back there. Raise your hand, say, look, I want, I want another 10, and uh, he'll bring them to you so that when you see so many of the grocery stores, hey, look, I don't know if you go to church anywhere, but we want to tell you about Jesus, or we want to just get together with you and share what's going on in your life. So you can just invite people to come to church. Um, you can even ask, hey, do you have a home church? 
But uh, nonetheless, um, it's beautiful, the feet of those who bring good news. Don't you guys agree with me? Was that video not um, compelling um, and inspiring? Serious approach that we've been taking to understanding the sovereignty of God. Um, and this past year, that's really what we've been zeroing in on. And I think it's appropriate in light of what's going on with all the uncertainties uh, in this world. And we started out with our study um, in the book of Job. You guys remember Job and the difficulties and trials that that man went through. It's hard to get your mind around. And then, of course, we looked at the life of Daniel, Daniel the prophet. We went through the book of Daniel. And then, of course, we ended up in um, studying the life of Joseph back in Genesis. All three of these men were um, burdened with greater storms than any of us have ever experienced. I'm sure of it. Um, few people could handle those kind of storms, and they still continue to praise the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So be encouraged, it is possible. So we continued in this um, theme of sovereignty and God's providence so that uh, we know that God is on the throne and He allows things to happen. So when we ask the question of God, why are you letting this happen is another question, but perhaps He can provide the answer because in His providence, he can open doors that no man closes, and he'll close doors that no man can open. And that is very, very good to know. Uh, and with this knowledge, we can realize that God is in control in a world that is out of control. And that can bring some security, can it not? So we know, I believe, that there is a storm brewing all throughout the world. Um, things are odd. Things are getting weird. Things are really, it seems to be setting up for uh, a world leader perhaps to come in place, for a world government to be pushed down our throats. But uh, what a wonderful time it is to be studying the book of Revelation, is it not? Now, uh, uh, a few months ago, when I was, when I was going for a walk, um, I was searching and saying, Lord, I, I, you know, what's next after getting out of Joseph and the sovereignty of God? And I said, Lord, what's next? And then I'm thinking an easy book. Well, let's just study the book of James. You know, it's a book of wisdom for the, for the New Testament. It's the Proverbs of the New Testament. And, and, and I, God pressed up. No. And I'm going, for, what about 1 Peter? And then, you know, what about Ephesians? What about Galatians? What about one of the other letters? So God said, no, no, no. And, and I, I knew my heart. He was leading me. So you need to teach in Revelation. And oh my goodness, I was thinking, no, I'm intimidated. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I could pull that off. I don't, that's just, that's, a, but then the uh, Lord said, yes, go ahead and do it. And, and um, although it's been a really um, difficult study to um, process and understand, but then to be able to sort out and uh, share with others takes it to another level of, of depth. So uh, my studies have been wonderful, but they, I can't say that they haven't been difficult. Um, but, but I'm telling you what, the, uh, the blessing that's coming from it is totally amazing. My, my faith is growing. So I hope that you too uh, can be part of the blessing that's promised in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Now, um, the revelation came to John from the glorified Jesus while he was, um, you know, on that island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea. Um, he was exiled there, and he, it was about 85, um, 95 AD, and um, Jesus is um, now speaking to and ministering to and communicating with John. Um, this book called Revelation, and he starts out in chapter one. He's talking about um, how uh, he, everyone who reads the word and hears the word of this prophecy, so it, it says of itself it's a prophecy, um, will be blessed, and those who keep it. So the point I want to make on that is that the repetition is a great teacher. So I've challenged you guys every week to, to get into God's Word and read through the book of Revelation as much as you possibly can. Um, at minimum, read a couple chapters ahead, drop back and make sure you read chapters 1 through 5 so you can really be, have a firm foundation of where we've been so that when we study the Word, you are going to understand it a lot, a lot more clearer. Otherwise, as we have building blocks in this study, when we get to um, chapter 13 and 14 and 15, um, chapters 1 through 12 won't seem as foreign and won't seem quite as difficult. Are you with me? So I want you to commit to doing that. I put on a challenge for anybody who read um, whatever times they, they read the book of Revelation. I would double that, and um, I think I, I'm at my match, but I'm working on it still. 
and uh, we're so glad to be able to do it. So if you don't believe repetition is true, have you guys ever heard of uh, the Beverly Hillbillies? <laughs> there once was a story about a man named Jed, poor mountaineer bear that kept his family fed, but then one day he was shooting at some food, and up from the ground came a bubbling pool, oil that is black gold, Texas tea. So the next thing you know, old Jed's a millionaire, kin folks said, Jed, move away from there. Said California is the place they ought to be. So he loaded up the truck and he moved to Beverly. So why in the world would I sing that? Because it's proof. I had never had any intention whatsoever of ever knowing that song. But when you watch Beverly Hillbillies for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, and you hear that song over and over and over and over and over again, it's in you. I never set out to memorize that silly song. And, but so it is. When we're in the Word of God, over again and over again and over again and over again and over again, you're going to begin to get things. Lights are going to come on. New stuff is going to be revealed to you. And so it is with this promise of a blessing of reading God's Word. Would that not be cool to be able to sing Revelation in that way? When you, for, for me, it's listening to the book of Revelation when I walk. I'm, I be, I've, I've listened to it so many times now that I, I'm, I'm able to now um, anticipate the words that are next when I hear them. Now, I, I look at the words a little bit and I read, of course, I read it you know, and thoroughly study it. But when you hear it over and over and over again, you begin to anticipate. So then when you, when you get stuck on a spot, it's all going to make sense. Are you guys with me? So I want to encourage you to do that. So quick review. Um, there's an outline that was given in chapter 1 of verse 19. I'll briefly hit that. Um, and it talks about the past, the things which, which you saw. Uh, talking about Jesus and the glorified Jesus, and the present, the things which are, and then the future, the things that will take place after this. And of course, chapters 2 and 3 um, was the, the seven letters to the seven churches in the seven cities there in Asia Minor. And of course, Jesus wrote these, and that represented the time that it was written for those seven churches, but it also carried up through to the place now until we hit that one day where we're raptured out of you. That would be considered the present time. And of course, chapters 4 through 22 zero in on the, the, the future, the future things. However, chapters 4 and 5 were really a, a, an interlude, um, kind of setting the stage for chapters 6 through 19, 19, 6 to be exact, where um, it's, it's shared and everything that's going on. And John, of course, is ushered in the presence of God as he goes through the throne room of God and the, and the, and the door that was open. And then he, he sees God and then he sees um, lights and bright lights and thunding, peals of thunder and lightning. And um, then there's 24 um, elders around the throne. And then there's four cherubim or mighty um, angels, perhaps. And then all this rumblings and thunders. And then, of course, it moves from chapter 4 to... Um, with the, with the elders and the throne, the throne of God and around the throne of God. Um, and then there's the, the, the scroll that had seven seals on it. And then God is uh, reaching out and handing the scroll to no John doesn't know who. And then he's broken and he's crushed and he starts to wail and cry and have no idea who's going to be able to open the throne. And then, of course, he's reminded that uh, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, would be the one to open it, as he is reminded by uh, one of the elders. And, of course, we were introduced to this paradox that how in the world can Jesus be both a lion and and a lamb. That is a paradox. It's bewildering. However, um, the paradox uh, becomes more clear when we understand that when Jesus was on the cross, he was murdered as a lamb, a helpless lamb. But ultimately, Satan didn't realize that he was going to rise from the dead like a roaring lion. Hence, you have Jesus, both a lion and a lamb. And last week, of course, we learned a little bit about the harp um, and its relationship to worship. And then, of course, we talked about uh, the golden bowls of incense, which um, is in relation to our prayers and how we can be in worship and in prayer together as a sweet aroma and a wonderful communion with the living God. And that is a beautiful place to be. So um, Jesus is going to open, he's going to break open these seven seals, revealing the contents of the scroll, because worthy is the Lamb. Now, chapters 6 through 19, for those of you who are new to the Bible, uh, it's probably going to freak you out, some of the stuff that's in there. 
I mean, really freak you out. I mean, it's still a little bit weird, um, odd, um, beguiling, and scary, all those kind of adjectives you put together with it. So what I've decided to do is have more of a, 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 a prepper for what's ahead, because in the next weeks and months ahead, there's going to be some intensity, and there's going to be some anxiety, and you're going to start to worry less about you and more about family members. That's why I titled the message, Before the Wrath. And what I really want to do today, my goal, my, my goal is to share with you that God is not a mean God. He's not an angry God. He's not a God from the Old Testament that you picture that will smite you and crush you and defeat you out of sport, but that He is long-suffering and wishes that no one should perish. So I want to really have uh, that foundation really strongly built um, in addition to what we've already studied in the sovereignty and the providence of God. We, I hope today that the way you're going to grow from this message will be to know and realize that God is long-suffering, doesn't want anyone to suffer. And that's good news, is it not? So we're going to look at before the wrath and the outline of the three types of judgment or, or the wrath um, found um, in these um, these chapters of the Bible. So the three that will help you get through and understand this are the seven seals of the judgment, uh, which starts in chapter 6, and then the seven trumpets of judgment, which is in chapter um, 8, and then, of course, the seven bowls of judgment. And if you guys want to begin to process that, that's how the divisions of this, the rest of the book is going to look like. Those, uh, those three divisions will each have seven um, seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. So in chapter 6, of course, um, we see the seven seals where the lamb is going to break open these seals and it's going to reveal um, what's coming on earth. And that's, where the, that's when the good stuff begins. So we're going to jump into that next week. I'm sorry for those of you who are hoping we were jumping in today. But again, I'm hoping to accomplish um, that security to know that when someone asks you the question of why do bad things happen to good people or why would God, why a good loving God send someone to hell, hopefully you'll have some ammunition for your weapons, if you will. So God's judgment is coming, the great tribulation is coming, and uh, we're going to see that after the last bowl is spilled open out of the seven bowls, there will be the marriage supper of the Lamb and the second coming of Jesus Christ, and Jesus is coming back, and that is awesome, is it not? But not before a seven-year great tribulation. So uh, it's difficult to read, it's really difficult to read and consider that these harsh kinds of judgments are coming on a world, and many people have no idea it's coming. It seems terrible. So um, the three reasons why um, are, we're going to answer today as to uh, why God would allow and be part of um, this type of misery and judgment and wrath. So the first answer, the first question is uh, why, is to, to bring people to repentance. Now, if you're taking notes, um, bring people to repentance. Can you guys repeat that? Why would God allow things like this to happen to people? The second one is to demonstrate God's patience. Can you say that? To demonstrate God's patience. And the third one is to establish God's justice. So, uh, so we're going to zero in on those three points today, and that's going to be our message. So the first purpose of God's judgment is to bring people to repentance. Now, the pur purpose of ju judgment is redemptive. Now, if you know what the word redemptive means, it means to saving from error. It's an effort to get people to turn from their sins and turn to God. And instead of these judgments being explosive or sudden, uh, we're going to see in chapter 6 through um, 19 that it's going to be a slow, gradual increasing of intensity, almost like a woman in birth pain. Um, so it'll grant people the time to come, in, to come to faith in Jesus. As a matter of fact, according to verses 9 through 11, um, we'll come to faith in Jesus during the great tribulation, these seven-year period, people will be coming to faith in Jesus. And uh, we can look at uh, Ezekiel 33, 11. We need to remember that the Lord has said this, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure 
and the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their wicked ways and live. So the key word there is turn. Another word for that is repent from your evil ways. Um, so why will you die? The call to redemptive repentance, this turning, is found in Revelation over and over and over again. Um, as a matter of fact, we've covered it when we were in the book of Revelation in uh, Laodicea in Revelation 3.19. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. And those judgments are being carried out um, for the express purpose of people to turn. I'd be willing to bet that most of us in here, when we came to faith in Jesus, it was in the middle of a really difficult time in your life. And I'd say, God has got your attention. Wait a minute, have you guys experienced that? When you were, when you were, for, for me, it was a relationship, and it was financial, and it was work. Three massive things all going on at one time, and I finally cried out to God. I said, God, if you're real, show yourself to me. And I think most people go through that as well. God wants to rescue you. He wants to save people. So the purpose of judgment is redemptive. It's not punitive. In other words, God seeks to measure um, with correction, not to just punish. And of course, in that, there's reconciliation and not retribution. So the word for punish is uh, found only one time in the entire book of Revelation in chapter 17, 1, and it's speaking about the punishment of that great harlot, the prostitute, um, which is also known as uh, the, the woman who represents the mystery Babylon of the one world government in the end times. Just one time is that word used. So what's interesting, there's a sense of wonder on the parts of... Um, the inhabitants of heaven. So, so let, let's say you're, in, you're angels in heaven and you're in the mezzanine, you're in the bleachers and you're watching what's going on on the earth and you're seeing all this destruction, you're seeing all the things going on, um, yet people willfully remain stubbornly and violently anti-God and say, I don't want any part of it. Listen to what Revelation 9, 20, 21 says. It's the sixth trumpet. Um, remember, there's scroll judgment, there is trumpet judgments and bowl judgments. So it's the sixth trumpet, Revelation 9. It says, The rest of mankind that were not killed by the plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, wood, idols that it cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of, then he goes on to list the, the, their murders, they didn't repent of them. They didn't repent of their magic arts. They didn't repent of their sexual immorality. And they did not repent of thefts. So the picture there is fairly simple that these people's hearts are so hardened, they're so wicked, they refuse to repent. They refuse to uh, admit anything wrong. In fact, um, people seem to harden their hearts further. The more, the further they get away from God, the more wicked and more evil and more hard they become. And we see the fourth bull, um, the scroll of the trumpet bowl, is uh, where they seared, in Revelation 16, 9, they were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent in turn and give Him glory. Do you guys know anybody like that, who are just stubborn and rebellious and refuse to repent and turn to the living God? I do. Am I the only one? Did anybody come to mind when I said that? <laughs> now you're telling the truth. I did too. So this refusal to submit their hearts to God gave them, an they just refused to, um, to acknowledge God and His creation. God demonstrates the appropriate. So ultimately, the point I'm trying to make is ultimately, um, by people's actions, it demonstrates um, a reason for them to be separated from God because they refuse to uh, repent. Stubbornness uh, is always connected to surrendering our wills to God. So why would someone want to surrender? Um, why would someone need to surrender um, to, to Jesus? Well, let me read something Paul wrote in scriptures. Um, this is about 57 AD. Um, he wrote it from Corinth. And it's in the book of, uh, I think this is Romans. It says, But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, a prescribed time period. 
and with his judge, righteous judgments will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what he has done. Now we can reflect on Romans 2, 5, and 8 and Revelations 20. To those who, by persistence in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will, God will give eternal life. Not because of their deeds, but just the fruit of their deeds. But for those who are self-seeking, um, now I've heard it said that sometimes self-seekers, um, you find when someone comes into church, they're either going to be um, builders, kingdom builders, or they're going to be inspectors. Now, anybody knows about building homes? Um, if you're a builder and you have the building inspector, typically they're there to pick things out that you did wrong. So I hope and pray that if you guys uh, would all become builders and part of building the kingdom instead of building inspectors, I think the church would be better off, don't you? Can I get an amen? amen? And who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. So it's interesting um, when you look at the word stubbornness, and we go back to the concordance, and we, and we, and we figure out what, what the Greek says about the original word of this, it is, um, it's number 4642 in the um, Strong's Concordance here, and it's called scleros. Now, scleros means callous, um, or when we hear the word arterial sclerosis, uh, which means the medical term for hardening or hardening of the arteries. So the spiritual parallel is when someone is spiritually hardened, nothing you can say or nothing you can do is going to change their stubborn, callous hearts, and there's no room for repentance in their hearts and minds. So the first, first purpose of um, judgments is to bring people to repentance. The second purpose of judgment is to demonstrate God's patience. Um, and God is really, really, really amazingly patient um, and I know that he's patient with me. Is he patient with you? Yeah. So in the second chapter of Revelation, verses 18 to 29, Jesus corrects the church of Thyatira for tolerating this woman by the name of Jezebel. Do you remember her? Uh, who was advocating sexual immorality as part of being an acceptable lifestyle for the follower of Christ. Um, she was a threat to the church's spiritual health. But Jesus said this remarkable thing about her. He said, I have given her time to repent of her immorality. This is what he said. But she is unwilling. So Jesus has a remedy. I can fix that. Let's see if I can get her to repent. I will cast her on a bed of suffering. This is the living God. This is Jesus saying what he's going to do. He's going to cast her on a bed of suffering. And I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intently unless they repent of their ways. Revelation 2, 21 to 22. I mean, does that not give us uh, the hope that God is um, long-suffering with stubborn people? Now, when we come to faith in Jesus, a lot of this doesn't apply to us. It's applying to those we know and love. So, we are perhaps going to be a little bit fearful knowing that our loved ones are stubborn, but they're going to miss out on what God has for them. They need to turn and repent and surrender to Jesus. Now, some more examples of um, how the Lord is long-suffering. Uh, have you guys heard about the name of someone by the name of Abraham? Well, there's an old Hebrew story that involves Abraham who was sitting outside his tent one night when he saw an old man walking in the distance. And it was a cold night. So Abraham rushed out to greet him, invited him into his tent, and he washed the old man's feet. It's kind of custom of the day. Um, and he placed him before there at the dinner table and gave him something to eat. So the old guy immediately um, took the food and began to stuff his mouth without even thanking God. So what does Abraham do? He says, what are you doing? Aren't you going to pray and give thanks to God for his goodness? And the weary old man said, well, I worship fire and reverence no other God. Abraham became infuriated, so he grabbed the old man, pulled him out by his feet, and launched him back out into the cold of the night. Now, a short, short while later, God came visiting Abraham. Um, of course, they were old buddies. And he said, hey, where's that stranger I sent your way? You know, the old man you invited to your tent to share food with and lodging. And Abraham said, I cast him out from me uh, because he didn't want to worship you and follow your laws. And then God said in a slow, 
deliberate voice. I have put up with that man for 87 long years while he dishonored me. Could you not endure him for just one night? I mean, that's a great way to consider how impatient we are and we forget how patient our God is. We should learn to be more patient with others, should we not? Another Old Testament example, have you heard of a guy by the name of Jonah? Uh, well, God was patient with the people of Nineveh. If you know anything about Nineveh, they were pretty, bad, pretty wicked people. He endured their evil rebellion and violence for a number of years. And then he asked Jonah to go preach there. Well, he might not ask. He probably just told him to go preach there. And um, if you guys ever want to make God laugh, then tell him what you're going to do. And so that's what um, Jonah's mission was to go um, rescue a whole entire group of people from God's eventual wrath if they never repented. So um, Jonah basically said, nope, I'm not going to do it. And you know what the result was, what happened? Well, he was ate up by a fish in the belly of a whale. Maybe it was a whale, a large fish. So he was three days and three nights um, in, in that belly of the whale. And, um, but ultimately, God had other plans for him, and the whole entire city was saved and set free. Um, so I guess the question is, if God tells you to go and share either the gospel or offer prayer or invite to church or invite to some kind of fellowship or just over for dinner or out for lunch, if God were to ask you that this week and in the name of Jesus, he's going to, what are you going to do? I don't think God's going to throw you in the ocean. You're going to gobble up by a, a large fish. Um, but I think that... Um, Jonah was so adamant against God that uh, it, it was kind of a death sentence. He was dead for three days. Some people are so incredibly stubborn, they're willing to die before they do something. Don't let that be you. Are you guys with me? Another Old Testament example is Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, we forget that God waited until the situation became hopeless you know, Abraham begged him, oh, please don't, don't wipe out the people, don't, how about if you just find 10 people, there weren't even 10 people, and you know, you did, did a, did a quick search, and there could have been 40 or 50 or 60,000 people in the area, but God did not send judgment until the very end, and it was an unrepentant people, and of course, um, the story about Noah, prior to the great flood, um, he gave the people, and Noah was preaching to these people for 120 years, Think about how long God put up with those people who were mocking Noah when he preached and said, hey, look, you, got, you guys have got to get right with God, and you know, there's, there's a flood coming, so, so get it together, guys. 1 Peter um, 3.20 kind of reflects on that. It says, um, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few, eight in all, were saved through the water. So God is long-suffering, very long-suffering with your friends and with mine, and perhaps we should do the same for them. Another New Testament example can be found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, talking about Pontius Pilate, his wife sent to him saying, have nothing to do with that just man, talking about Jesus, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. So Pontius Pilate had this unique opportunity of knowing and hearing about Jesus for three and a half years, and he had the opportunity uh, to, to dismiss Jesus because he knew in his heart he was innocent, but instead he does this ceremonial thing and washes his hands clean of it, bringing judgment on himself. So instead of uh, making the right decision, um, he really, I'm sure he's sitting in hell right now. He chose to listen to what many of our friends um, hear in their mind is, um, have nothing to do with Jesus. It's just another religion. And I, 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 I see it more and more and more. You know, don't mix politics with religion. Don't mix this with religion. Don't mix that with religion. But Jesus is, is the only way. Um, so um, I think that um, this guy who was trying to uh, do the right thing by just dismissing it, um, washed his hands of any chance of getting into heaven. So... Um, we're going to see also in Revelation 6.16, 6, 
uh, where we see the people are going to actually be running from Jesus, hiding in caves, hoping that the rocks would kill them rather than face the lamb. It says, uh, it said there, um, fall on us and hide from us the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb, um, running from the cure. So the first purpose of judgment is to bring people to repentance. The second purpose of judgment is to demonstrate God's patience. And of course, the third purpose of judgment is to establish God's justice. Now, we live in the United States of America. Are you guys with me? We're a constitutional republic, and by true definition, not a democracy. That's closer to what would be considered a, um, a, social, a socialist um, system of government. But we're still a constitutional republic. So um, compared to a strict, oppressive dictatorship, we still have freedom, right? I mean, nobody was followed here by police officers on your way to church. You had the freedom to leave your home. There's no checking in and checking out. So we still have a lot of freedoms in this, uh, in this country that we live in. If you had no rights, you'd be oppressed by those who had power over you. If you looked... Uh, at some of the countries in the world where there's people come in and steal and rob and kick them out of their houses, steal their homes, and do horrible things to family members without any recourse. Um, I think that all of us would love to see judgment come on those wicked people. Would you guys not agree? Bad things are happening to people. You want justice to be served. Um, and you're pretty much powerless. You want justice to be served. So if there were no righteous judgments, um, it would be hard to tell how long it would take before there would be justice come in when there's injustice. I want to give you an example of this injustice. Back in, uh, during World War II, when the Jews were being systematically annihilated, no one seemed to care. I mean, think about it. Um, they cried out for justice, but there was none. Germany was placing them in ghettos, eventually into death camps, and the European countries would not allow them to immigrate. Not even the United States pretty much ignored them as well. The Jews suffered more than any other group in the history of the world. No one came to their defense until it was just about too late. It was carefully planned conspiracy to commit genocide. They looked for justice, but they couldn't find any way. No one came to their, to their defense. And so the nations of the world finally did bring judgment against um, Germany, and they liberated the Jews um, from those terrible death camps. And of course, the global sigh of relief was great. I watched the uh, Nuremberg Trials, or a movie leading a little bit of a biography of a guy who actually was maybe 26 or 27 years old, a Jew who actually um, held those trials there. And it, it kind of, you, you felt good that justice was served with wicked people. So God's justice is going to be carried out uh, on an unjust and ungodly world um, because God takes sin seriously. And unfortunately, the world that we live in, uh, sin seems to be um, not much of a spoken word in churches these days. And that's pretty sad, I think, don't you? Now, granted, the pendulum, perhaps, um, over the years, swung a little bit too much over with fire and brimstone, and all you ever heard was, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, even though you have eternally, e eternal security in Jesus. But the pendulum has swung way back over, and God loves you, and God loves you, and God loves you, and everything you do is going to be okay, no problem, there's going to be no consequences, and there's no sin, and there really isn't a hell. So the pendulum has swung way over. So I think that if we go through the Word of God, systematically, we're going to be able to cover every single issue God wants us to, to know and hear and do. And that's what we're doing in the book of Revelation. So um, people need to hear that there is going to be judgment, there is going to be justice, and there will be wrath on those who reject and say no thanks to the living God. Um, and we have to be, as believers, uh, be a little bit like John the baptizer. We have to be able to you know, call sin what it is. It doesn't have to be judgmental because God's the judge, but however, you know, when you know someone is stealing from an employer or something like that or, or having an adulterous affair with someone that's not their wife or their husband, um, things like that we're called to bring to attention and show, you can even show like, like Ray Comfort did with this guy, he had just the four, ten, four of those Ten Commandments. Um, 
he zeroed in on it and convicted the young man. He brought him to tears because he knew he wasn't right with God. And oftentimes when we do it in love, like Ray Comfort did, um, we produce fruit, but far too often we just skip the whole entire deal. We just don't do it at all because we don't like to be confrontational. I hate confrontation. Don't you hate confrontation? I hate it. I'm going to run from it. However, I think that because I know the importance of sharing the love of Jesus with others in light of eternity is a long time to be separated from Him. We've got to be able to overcome. And a lot of people are going to thank you in the long run. So why these judgments? Well, the first one was um, the purpose of judgment is to bring people to repentance. Um, have you repented? Are you continuing to repent? The second purpose of judgment is to demonstrate God's patience. See, God is long-suffering. He is really patient. Um, but unfortunately, there's a lot of stubborn people in the world. How are you doing? What's your degree of stubbornness on a scale of 1 to 10? I don't know, but man, I'm up there far too often. We refuse to surrender to God's plan. And the third purpose of judgment is to establish God's justice um, because really, ultimately, we're all on death row for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is in Jesus Christ. So if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, I think you, you need to consider doing it because you, you need to receive a pardon. So when will God's wrath begin? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about that um, next week. That's we're going to really start zeroing in on um, the, the wrath itself, but leading up to it, we're going to touch on Daniel a little bit and then 2 Thessalonians and Matthew 24. But um, I want to finish with this illustration. In May of 1984, an issue of the National Geographic displayed color photos of drawings of volcanic destruction that wiped out the Roman cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum in 79 AD. Now, many of you have heard of this before, um, at Mount Vesuvius. An eruption was so sudden that the people were killed in the middle of their routine. Men and women at the market. Wealthy were caught in luxurious baths. The slaves were laboring in the fields. They died as they were covered by volcanic ash and superheated gases. It's hard to imagine the horrible that they experienced that day. Perhaps the saddest part is that no one actually had to die. Why do I say that? Well, scientists tell us the ancient Roman writers who um, cataloged all of this said that uh, weeks before there was rumblings and there was signs that actually preceded the explosion that would eventually occur. So the warning was there, but they flat out ignored the warning. There was uh, even a threatening pillar of smokes, which could be clearly seen several days before the eruption, but you almost want to say, are you kidding me? You, you had all the warning signs, but you decided to stay anyways. And so it is with the people that we communicate with on a regular basis. They're going to be stubborn, but you need to continue to persist, continue to persist, continue to persist, continue to persist, and share these warnings. The end is near. God's wrath is close. He doesn't want anyone to be separated from him. But 1 Corinthians, Paul says, Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring the light, what is hidden in darkness, and will expose the motives of men's heart. And time will receive praise from God. So when does God's wrath begin? Well, let me read one verse, and this is the verse we'll clo close with. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 and 12 says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of heavens by fire and the elements will melt with heat. God is serious. We need to get ready. And we need to get ready before the wrath. And that means sharing the love of Jesus with others. Amen. Let's all stand as we sing one more time. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. Oh, if 
for more of you means less of me. Take everything. Yes, all of you. It's all I need. Take everything. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. Can I pray for you guys? Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and I'm thankful, Lord, to know that you're a long-suffering God. And I know, I think many of us know or realize or believe that time is short in the life that we live. So we need to readjust the way we live our lives because we're just passing through. Uh, we're, we're one day going to take our last breath, but Lord, help us not to leave this earth without that one mission, to seek and save those who are lost and live our lives for Jesus. So bless the congregation today. I pray that anyone needs prayer, that you might come up and might come together with a brother and sister in Christ and be encouraged. I pray that this family congregation, this church right here, might be blessed. They have a really good week, and that uh, there will be some testimonies perhaps next week of uh, how God's doing a work in their lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's children said, God bless you all.